Well, good morning. It is, uh, it is week two of our uh, Christmas series called The Light of the World, and, and last week we, uh, we read from the prophet Isaiah about the Messiah who was to come. Centuries before Jesus' birth, God delivered a message, a message through Isaiah that a perfect servant would come. He would bring justice to the nations, and he would be a light in the darkness. And this servant would do what all other servants could not do, because this servant would be God in the flesh. There was hope for Israel, and there is hope for us because of Jesus. God is compassionate toward his people. He hears their cries for help and he answers their prayers. We know that King Jesus will return because he always keeps his promises. Now today, we're going to look at the peace that Jesus brings. And so if you have your Bible with you today, and I hope that you do, please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. You're going to find Luke in the New Testament right after Matthew and Mark. We are going to Luke chapter 2 today. Luke chapter 2, but we're going to begin in verse 8. Luke 2, 8, and we are going to uh, read there. Um, So Luke 2, 8 through uh, 20. Luke 2, 8. Please follow along as I read the Word of God aloud. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today... In the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped, in, wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth. To people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. Thanks be to God for his word. God's plans are always better than ours, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, we make, we make all the plans in the world, but God's plans are always better. As we read about Jesus coming into the world, it doesn't surprise us that God had a plan. That, that doesn't surprise us. What surprises us is that This was the plan. This. It was so unexpected, and yet it wasn't an accident. I mean, it happened exactly in the way that it was planned. I mean, I don't know that we often recognize the complexity of it all. We don't appreciate the attention to detail. I mean, we know that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. We know that part was intentional. We know that Jesus came willingly. He obediently fulfilled the mission that he was given, which was, wasn't just to be born, but was to, to live and to die as a man 
but how it all happened. It wasn't a mistake. The Word became flesh in the exact way that He intended to. And the birth of God's perfect Son went perfectly. Caesar Augustus issued the decree that a census would be taken in all of the land, and Mary and Joseph, they made it to Bethlehem. The shepherds, yet, were in the field just as where they should be. Everybody was in the right place. They were exactly where they were supposed to be on this one night. And starting in verse 9, it says, Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look. Now hold up, hold up just a second here. Right there, you you got the wrong address. You got the wrong address here. Uh, No, we were sent to shepherds. I know, I think you mean scribes, though. We, this sort of thing happens all the time. Uh, you know, we're always getting their mail and whatnot in the, out here. Uh, they're just five miles down the road, uh, just going to Jerusalem, the third place on the left. Uh, you'll find them, I don't know why, seriously, why does this keep happening? You can't miss it. No, listen, I proclaim to you good news. Of great joy that will be for all of it. Yeah, but here's the thing. All people, I mean, really all, so there's all people, and then there's those people, and we're, we're those people. That's who we are. No, really. A Savior was born for you. Now, I don't know if that's really the way it took place, but I imagine that it might have happened like that. And so if you're taking those today, and I highly recommend that you, you do, write this down. Because of Jesus, there is good news for bad people. There is good news for bad people here. I mean, we look at the shepherds. I mean, this good news was so unexpected. Why? Because the shepherds were not good people. I mean, we like to think of them as simple, salt-of-the-earth types. And yet... And yet, there is nothing desirable about these guys or their profession. I mean, sure, it may have once been a respectable occupation. I mean, go back to Genesis. We read that Abel was a shepherd. I mean, we know that Isaac and Jacob, they also kept sheep. When, when God appeared to Moses, he was watching his, his father, uh, father-in-law's flock, Jethro, you know, he's watching Jethro's sheep. And even King David... Even King David, the shepherd boy from Bethlehem. However, by the time we get to the first century, shepherds, they are not admirable people. They could not vote. They could not hold public office. Their testimony was not admissible as uh, evidence because their witness was not credible. The most pious of Jews would not buy things from the shepherds, things like wool or milk or other sheep, because they just assumed that it was stolen. Shepherds were notorious for stealing sheep. Be like, that's mine, that's mine, that sheep is also mine. And they would sell the wool, they would sell the milk off as their own. And so they were treated with contempt. They were, con- they were treated with prejudice. I mean, a philosopher in Alexandria at the time said, there is no more disreputable an occupation than a shepherd. They cannot be trusted. They are brute, thieving, deplorable men who prefer the company of animals and other men than they do community life. That's what they wrote. Shepherds. I mean, Alexandria is the center of the intellectual world at the time, and that's what they thought. They saw them as thieves. They were dirty, rotten scoundrels. But what about the Jews? Well, we, we, we go to, to uh, we find a passage in the Mishnah that says, shepherds are incompetent. No one should ever feel obligated, <laughs> hear this one, no one should ever feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen in a pit. They were outcasts from society. And, and for the religious, they'd be like, hey, they're outcasts from God. 
They're spiritually unclean. They are unworthy of saving. So you can understand that they are in for the shock of their lives. The shock of their lives. Not just are they hearing that there is good news, but they're hearing that they're hearing good news for them. I mean, it wasn't by accident that the angels appeared to the shepherds. They meant to do it. Of all the places, they meant to go there. God wasn't upset with the angels. The angels get back to heaven. God's like, oh man, you idiots. You wasted the good surprise on them. They did exactly what they were told. And God told them to go to the shepherds. Nobody was expecting good news of this magnitude. Nobody expected to hear good news of great joy, especially not the shepherds. They were not good people. Good people get good news. Good stuff happens for good people. These are bad people. These guys are unfit, not just for the religious community, they're unfit for the community at large. Now, before we do a deep dive into the existential question of why do bad things happen to good people, you need to know that there was only one good person, and he volunteered. This is good news for people like us. People like us. God says, you are worth it. I am sending my number one. I am sending my very best to you. I am giving you the best gift ever. I'm sending my son. And just as the angels proclaimed to the shepherds that night, God says, you are worth coming for. He says, we are worth rescuing. See, God gives worth. He who is worthy can bestow worth. He's the only one capable of giving worth. He who is infinitely valuable assigns value to what? The lowly, the despised, the forgotten. And on that first Christmas, Jesus didn't come to the rich. He didn't come to the successful. He certainly didn't come to the ones who had it all together. He came to the poor. He came to the outcast. The dirty. The rejected. A sinner. I mean, forget about the self important, forget about the self righteous. On this night, his birth wasn't celebrated by the religious, it wasn't proclaimed to the rulers. The message came to shepherds, and they would not be overlooked, they would not be forgotten. The message would not get lost in translation along the way. Jesus is good news for all people, but on that night, especially, it is good news for bad people. He didn't come to call the righteous but sinners. Just as he would minister to tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers and Samaritans, he came to seek and save that which was lost. And this means that nobody is beyond saving. Jesus is willing and able the next thing we need to see is that Jesus is the perfect Savior for imperfect people. Because of Jesus, there's a perfect Savior for imperfect people. Just as the shepherds had uh, separ been separated from the rest of society, our sins had separated us from God. I mean, ever since Eden, ever since Eden, the garden, man had lived in active rebellion against God. We didn't care about God's plans. We didn't care about God's purposes. Time and time again, we only did what we wanted to do. He made us in his image. He knit us together in our mother's womb, and yet we have desecrated his masterpiece. 
Time and time again. Sin, sin has ruined every part of the universe. Every inch is touched by sin. And our all holy, our, our, our holy, our all perfect God has started over once already. He's already started over once. I mean, people know they're not friends with God. You can't be friends. They know that they are at odds with God. We had to perform religious rituals just to get close to him. We had to perform the, those things just to come near. I mean, there was a ceremonial cleansing that needed to be observed. We couldn't be righteous on our own. We had to offer sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice to satisfy the need for justice. But it was only good for a time, and it was only good for a few people. Even the priest making the sacrifice, he always was running the risk of just dropping dead in the presence of our holy God. I mean, think about how much God had been wronged over and over and over and over and over again by everybody. We are not friends with God. We're not friends. We were separated from him, and with every sin, we move further and further away from him. And then... A Savior comes. Then a Savior comes to save his people from their sins. I mean, that's what the angel said. The angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. One has come to save. That's what saviors do. They save. Sinners sin and saviors save. While we were enemies with the Lord, the Lord came to his people. He came not to kill us. It was a possibility, right? He came not to kill us. He came not to kill them. He came to save them against this backdrop of injustice. The righteous one came to make all things right. Against this backdrop of bondage, the Messiah, he came to rescue. Against this backdrop of evil, the goodness of God is crammed into baby flesh. And when we couldn't get to God, God came to us. The skies split open that night, and all around the shepherds was bright as day. The Savior had come. And they were told, they were told to go and find him for themselves. Even though the shepherds, they didn't understand it all, the spotless Lamb of God had come to take away the sins of the world. The shepherds, they had to see for themselves, so they left their sheep to go find this one lamb. They left their sheep in search of one lamb. I mean, imagine the value of the one if you are willing to leave the rest of your sheep. Dare we say 99. On this night, the shepherds would go the distance. But years later, the good shepherd would go the distance for them. This baby in a manger would bear their sicknesses and carry their pains. He would be stricken for them. He would be struck down for all of us. He was pierced because of our rebellion and crushed because of our sins and iniquities, the Lamb of God took our punishment so that we might have peace. Punishment for peace. I mean, we were the ones who went astray. We were like the sheep. We were dumb. We were stupid. We were headstrong. We were foolish. We all turned our own way. But this one lamb, Mary's little lamb the perfect Lamb of God would be slaughtered for our peace. See the baby where he lay. In the manger, come and see. 
for the Savior will grow and one day die for a sinner such as me. This lamb would die for shepherds. The perfect one would die for imperfect ones. The hero would die in order to save the villain. Like the shepherds, we too were without hope and unable to experience peace. But Christ came because of the perfect salvation that our perfect Savior provided. We can now experience perfect peace. Perfect peace. The last thing we need to see is that there is peace for all who seek him. <clears throat> because of Jesus, there's peace for all who seek him. Let's, let's pick up in verse 13. It says, Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Do not all, not all who seek peace will find peace. It's only when we seek Him. You seek peace for peace's sake. No peace. You seek Him. You get peace. He's the only one who can bring us true peace. We can't find it anywhere else. I mean, think about this. Mary and Joseph, they went to Bethlehem because of a decree by Caesar Augustus. We've all heard the story, right? Except that wasn't his real name. At birth, he was given the name Gaius Octavius. I would change my name too. Caesar Augustus sounds better. As the adopted son of Julius Caesar, he became emperor. And in 27 BC, the Roman Senate, at his direction, bestowed on him the name Augustus, which means great, venerable, Worthy of reverence. Worship? Sure. Romans saw him as the exalted one, the celebrated one, holy one, the sacred one. Julius Caesar had formerly been deified by the Senate after his death, and so Augustus, he embraces the title of Son of God. He had coins. With, with his image and inscriptions such as divine Caesar and son of God. An Egyptian inscription uh, calls Augustus Caesar a, a star shining with the brilliance of the great heavenly Savior. Caesar is described as a God walking upon the earth in the flesh. Throughout the empire, the birth of the emperor is celebrated with boastful inscriptions about the peace that he brought to all the lands that he ruled. The famous Pax Romana, the Roman peace, had been in effect since 27 BC, but the absence of war does not guarantee the presence of peace. Let me say that again. The absence of war does not guarantee the presence of peace. Even the pagans of the day Noted that while the emperor may give peace from war on land, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns for more than even outward peace. The world lay under the curse of sin, gripped by violence and unrest, humanity longing for peace on earth and peace with God, but Caesar Augustus, the emperor Augustus, was just a pretender. He was a counterfeit God in the flesh. The real one, the real God in the flesh, the actual holy one, is lying in a manger in Bethlehem. He's not in a palace. And so Christ comes to provide the peace that all men long for, reconciliation with God. It is man's greatest need. God didn't send a soldier or a judge or a reformer or anybody else. He sent a Savior to bring peace. 
When Christ was born of Mary, a declaration was sent through the universe that God had declared the war was over. The war is over. God and sinners would be reconciled. God and sinner reconciled through Christ's death and resurrection. His coming is God's declaration that he no longer accepts the terms of our adversarial relationship. He says the war is over. I don't want to be enemies anymore. I forgive you. Let's not be enemies Let's make peace. So with the curse of sin broken, we can now experience peace with God because of Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace, bringing comfort and assurance to all who come to him by faith. The shepherds, the shepherds hurried off to Bethlehem and they were the first in line to see him. It was like they couldn't wait. They said, let's go straight there. Let's go. Let's see him. They can't wait. They can't get there fast enough. And whether they realized it or not, this was everything they had been longing for. It was their heart's desire. And they returned. It says in verse 20, they returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. This isn't just going back to work as usual. This isn't getting back to normal. Nothing is normal after this. You have a night like that, nothing's normal. Shepherds are glorifying and praising God. Shepherds are glorifying and praising God. I mean, the same guys who, I mean, filthy mouths. Just awful. But they return with a peace that they cannot contain. The things that occupied their, their hearts and minds earlier in the night, they're suddenly distant memories. After laying eyes on king, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I would imagine that the things they had once valued no longer held that same value. See, this peace it changes everything. And it does for us as well. If you have not accepted the terms of peace that Christ offers, I implore you to do so today. I mean, why would anyone delay? Why, why would you not want peace? Jesus wants to fill everyone with peace. A peace that passes all understanding. That peace is marked by joy and a desire for others to experience that same peace. And so like the shepherds, we take the light of Christ into the darkest corners and the darkest crevices of the world. Everything has changed. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He says that God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us a ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to the message of reconciliation to us. There is good news for bad people. There is good news for bad people. There is a perfect Savior for imperfect people. And there is a peace given to all who seek Him. Will you pray with me? God, we thank You for this wonderful gift. 
was so unexpected. Lord, you show up in the most unexpected places to the most unexpected people with the most unexpected blessings. And God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you gave us exactly what we needed when we needed it. The time was right. It was perfect. And you gave us the perfect gift. You gave us yourself. One who would save. Save us from the world sure save us from ourselves even better and Lord we thank you that, that now even 2,000 years later you offer that same salvation you offer that same peace to those who seek you there is still a willingness centuries, millennia later. There is still desire to save. While we can recognize that the world around us, little has changed. We thank you, God, that because of you, everything has changed for us. So God, we pray that that we would seek nothing else but you and your goodness and your peace and your faithfulness. Lord, that we would seek nothing else but you. That we would boast in nothing else but you. You have all that we need. Jesus, we want to see you face to face. We thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. May we come to you and bow down before you. For you are the Savior of the world.